In this series on water, we've been looking at all the different aspects of water, all these different ways that Scripture lays out God's truth through water. So we've talked about um, drinking water. We've talked about being created anew in water. Uh, We've talked about um, how water brings people together in relationships. Today we're going to look at another aspect of that, and that is the idea of being washed, being cleaned. Again, this is something that, that that spans time, space, culture, is that water is used to clean. So if you're cleaning your your kitchen utensils, you're cleaning your tools, if you're cleaning, again, your own bodies, whether a shower or a bath, uh, there's something really remarkably um, just powerful about when you've been working outside and you're all dirty, you go wash your hands for the first time and you're just like, oh, clean. Or like after a long day and you're you're kind of sticky, especially in here, I'm sorry, um, you get kind of sticky and you you feel like hot and and you get to just kind of wash the day off. You come up feeling refreshed. So washing is a key feature of water, but it's also a key image that God uses to describe what he does for us. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about how in Christ we are washed clean. Um, And specifically, we're going to take it at a specific angle. So not just that we're washed clean, but what does being washed clean by Christ do for how we see? Because obviously if you have something in your eyes, you can't see very well. Or if you've ever like, been driving and something splatters on your windshield, it's terrifying because you can't see where you're going. And one of the challenges is when we talk about sin, and sin just being um, that which is against what God wants. So if God wants you to give to your neighbor and even you don't, sin. God says, I don't want you to cross this boundary, and we do. It's sin. So sin is all of those things that we do, all those things that, that are a part of us that are contrary to how God designed us, contrary to what he desires for this world to flourish. Because God designed a good world. In the beginning, he looked at everything that was very good. And sin enters and it messes with that. And in our own life, when we're born into this world, um, we inherit a certain level of sin. There's a part of us from the very get-go that can't see quite right. It's just a result of being born human in this fallen world. And so it's kind of like, I have a bowl of mud right here. It's kind of like if you were to, you're born, you got mud on your eyes, right off the bat. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? I can't see any of you. Um, (laughs) You think of Adam and Eve in the garden, right? What did they do? They walked with God. They saw God. And then sin enters, and now they can't see him. Now there's there's a level of removal. And so when we're born into this world, we're blinded. Sure, we can still make out figures, like I can see roughly where people are, but, I, but you can't see fully or clearly. And not only is this the truth with God, that we're born and we can't see God, but it also affects how we see one another. Sin distorts, it blurs, it blinds our vision. And so I see people through a different lens, right? Because when I sin, it, it corrupts, it, it messy. So not only am I born sinful, but then I do all sorts of sinful things, um, Right? We, we say things about people because we, we feel jealous and so we, we speak out and we lash out against them. Um, we, we neglect responsibilities. We, we're focused on what I need and so we sin all the more and it, and it distorts and it blurs and it blinds us. And so now all of a sudden people look different because they don't look like creatures created in God's image that Jesus died for. They look like figures that I'm just trying to navigate around, right? Whether to get something out of or just stay out of my way. One of the ways that you can see this very clearly is the things that follow sin. So when you sin, two of the most common reactions, right, are guilt and shame. Guilt is internal. I feel guilty because I know I shouldn't have done that, and I did, right? That last donut was there for my wife, and I ate it. I feel guilty. So it's an internal feeling knowing that there was something I was supposed to do or not do, and I violated that. Shame, on the other hand, is communal. Shame is we as a community, whether it's your family, whether it's a society, your workplace, or as a church, we have a way that we live, and I violated that. So when you see cultures that are very shame-oriented, it's because they're very communally, communally oriented. I don't want to bring shame upon people by doing what is wrong. And one of the things you'll notice is when you experience guilt or shame, what's one of the first reactions we have? We don't look people in the eyes. It's painful, right? We don't want to see them. And so what happens is when I feel guilt or shame, I look down. I become consumed with it. Again, there's all sorts of ways you can see this just from your own experience. You can look around and see this in others or in in books or media. But notice how, like, when you're feeling guilty. So I feel like I've been particularly unkind. And somebody says, hey, PJ, I just want to tell you that you're a very kind person. My first reaction is, no, I'm not. (laughs) 
I don't see this person who's pouring love into me. I just see my own guilt. I'm turned inward. Or when I'm fully ashamed, I don't want to see people because that's painful for me, and so I'm just going to focus on myself. We become self-focused, we become turned inside, and we can't see past our own face. And so guilt and shame and sin, they, they blind us. And there's a couple of ways that we try to deal with it. So one of the ways we do is, is I feel guilty, and so I want to make myself feel better, and so I'm going to try and wipe this off myself. The problem is, in this sinful world, I, I, still, I still have sinful hands. I still do all sorts of things. And so what this looks like is I might say, you know, I'm feeling really bad, so I'm going to go do a bunch of good things to try and relieve myself from this guilt. Okay, so I'm going out. And I'm not saying these aren't good things. You might help people. But just notice the question I'm asking myself is not, who around me has God asked me to go help? The question I'm asking is, how can I feel better? And so people are just instruments towards that. And all I'm doing is I'm just rubbing that mud around, right? My hands are still dirty. I can't wash myself clean. Another thing we can do, you can just pretend it's fine, right? You can just choose to be shameless or guiltless. It's, I don't want to feel this way, so I'm just going to pretend that I don't have mud on my face. And you can tell yourself that. It's, you'll be deceiving yourself, and the truth will not be in you. And you'll be fumbling and wandering through the dark, what we're going to be looking at today is what Christ offers us as a solution. Because we can't rub this off on ourselves and we can't go on living pretending this is fine because we're still unable to see God. We're still unable to see people for who they really are. And so how does Christ wash us clean? To help us do this, we're going to be looking at two different accounts in Scripture, one in the Old Testament, one in the New. Um, two people who are part of a sinful world, so their afflictions that they're going to be washed from are actually not a direct response to something they did. Um, but nevertheless, they're born into a sinful world, so they're suffering, and God is going to bring restoration and washing to them. Um, the first one is the man of Naaman. We'll read about him a little bit, coming to the prophet Elijah for his condition. And now I get to try and read. Okay. If I goof up some words, just shout it out. You've got to proverbially hold my hand here. Okay, I think I can do this. This is 2 Kings 5. Naaman... Commander of the army of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. So he's very high up. He's a foreigner to the people of God. Um, so he's not part of Israel, but he's, he's a high up in his society. He's given great victory. He's a commander in the army. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. So he had a skin disease and that was very visible and it would isolate you. You'd be removed from people. They want to touch you. It would be a source of shame. So he's got this, this condition that's this great affliction toward him. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a girl from the land of Israel. All right, so not good, but they kidnapped this girl, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. So she works for Naaman's wife now, this girl who was kidnapped. And this little girl said to her mistress, that's Naaman's wife, would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So this little girl remarkably says, hey, I see you have this this shame, this, this issue that you need healing from, I know where you can find help. There's a prophet in the land of Samaria, and he could cure you of your leprosy. So verse 4, So Naaman went in and told his lord, that's the king, because he's the head of the command of the army, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send the letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman finds out there's a hope, right? I could possibly be washed of this, and so this little girl informs him, Hey, I know how you can... I know where you can find help. I know where you can get healed. So he goes to his, his boss, the king, and the boss says, yep, sounds good. You can go seek out this help. So he travels to Israel. Um, long story short, he ends up at Elijah's house. Elijah is this great prophet um, who does all sorts of works for, work for God. Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. So Elisha sends a messenger out. So he's, he's at Elisha's door. Elisha says, hey, can you go tell this guy, go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, and then leprosy's gone. Sounds like good news, right? Here's the cure. Here's the help. Naaman's response. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come to me, and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place, and cure this leper. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. 
So Naaman, his sin issue right now is pride. Had another blind spot. You see, he, he's used to being high up in command, right? So he says stuff, people do it. People treat him with honor and respect. And so the idea that this prophet wouldn't even come out and talk to him. He didn't, right? You're telling me, just go wash yourself? He's despising little things, right? He, just simply wash, what? No, I want you to come out. I want you to stand there. I want you to call upon the name of God. I want you to wave your hands and everything will be good. I, I wash in rivers all the time. They're way better than your water, right? Nothing happens. So he goes away in a rage, right? He can't understand how God could work through something so simple, so seemingly ordinary. So he despises it. Thankfully, his servant is wiser than he. But his servant came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? So he says, wait, wait, hold up. You want something grand, but did you hear him? He said he can clean you. Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Right? Ordinary water. Just washed water, paired with a promise from God through his prophet. Clean. Gone. So you have this story of this. this again, this is somebody who, from the Israel's perspective, this is an outsider, right? Those people, they're, they're kind of, in Israel's mind, they're, they're kind of already filthy. But now he's actually got a skin condition and he comes in and in washing and following God's command, um, this promise of God paired with water, clean. We're going to jump ahead to another story where somebody else is going to come needing to be clean. And this time it's in Jesus' ministry where somebody not only spiritually can't see what's happening but physically can't as well. And so we're going to be looking at John chapter 9 when a blind man um, comes in Jesus' path. This is John chapter 9. And as he passed by, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Right, so they want a one-to-one connection, right? I, he did this thing or somebody did this thing that has to make sense, right? This is, verse 3, Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus says, no, no, it's, it's not always a one-to-one. It's not always, I did this thing, therefore God said, all right, your punishment is blindness. It's part of being in this, this broken world, born sinful, born in just a world that's not functioning as God intends it. And so Jesus is going to do this then. Having said these things, he spit on the ground. So he spits out, Jesus spits out his own water into the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. So Jesus comes to him and, and offers a cure. He takes this man who already, his eyes don't already work, and he's like, well, let's just rub a little bit more mud on there. What difference does it make? He says, go wash that mud off. And as that man washed the mud off his eyes, something came with the mud. His own blindness just washed straight out. And the man came back seeing. For the first time in his life, this man had never seen. And now, with this water, according to the words and promises of Jesus, sight. Now, Jesus is going to use this instance to point to that this is more than just physical restoration because Jesus does care about physically restoring things. He started that in his ministry. He tells his his cousin John, tell John that the blind see, right? that the lame walk, that the mute speak, the prisoners are set free, all sorts of good things starting in Jesus' ministry. But Jesus is pointing to something much greater in his ministry too because what's going to happen is this blind man is going to come back and people are going to be caught off guard by this because they know this guy, right? He's he's always blind. He's always sitting right there. Now he's walking around. And so they're like, what what happens? They ask him and he says, hey, this Jesus guy told me this. And they go through this horrible deal. But the long story short is the people don't want this man testifying to what Jesus has done. And so they kick him out. They kick him out of the synagogue, the temple. They say, get out of here. We don't want you spewing this stuff anymore. You're you're putting at risk what we have going on here, our relationship with God. You're going to violate it. Now Jesus is going to come find this man again. Sorry. Okay, I think I found a spot. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, 
And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. So this man, he comes back with eyesight, but even greater than that, who does he get to see? He sees Jesus. And and the result of this is that he believes in Jesus and he worships him. And Jesus makes this profound statement that I came into this world in judgment so that those who don't see might see. Now physically, yes, there are blind people that Jesus gives eyesight to. But more crucially, those who, who cannot see God, he is far off, he's distant, we're blinded to him and his presence and his reality. And blind to one another, Jesus came so those people might be washed and see. And those who think that they see, those who think, yeah, this is, I, I can see just fine, might realize that they're blind. Those who seem like they have it all figured out. This is where Jesus is talked about it by the Apostle Paul as those, it's, this is foolishness to the wise, right? Those who, who think they have it figured out, it seems foolish. Because what Jesus is doing doesn't look, it, it's not really what it looks like. So when Jesus gets on trial, right, so he's before um, the councils and he's before Pontius Pilate, right, Pilate wants nothing to do with it, right? He, he, he can see a little bit, this man's innocent, but more than that, he sees the crowds and he sees his own power at risk, and so he says, you know, I want to wash my hands of this. I want nothing to do with it. Jesus, on the other hand, had everything to do with it. When, when the whole world's sin was there, Jesus didn't say, you know what, I'm out of here. I tried my best. I healed some people you guys still didn't believe. You guys, actually the people who did believe, you kicked out of the, your places. But Jesus took the world's sin and just became sin for us. Coated, plastered, all of it. And, and for most people, what they thought they saw, they saw a lunatic being killed. Just another criminal being hung. It's a normal Friday in the Roman Empire, right? But to those who Jesus gave the ability to see, they saw something different three days later. They, say, they saw that that criminal lunatic being crucified was somehow, some way, the savior of the world, becoming sin, being covered and coated and buried in it, so that he could rise and leave all of that mud and that sin buried in the ground. And the good news of Jesus is just like these two men, Naaman and this blind man, according to the promise of God with simple, ordinary water, you and I are washed clean. You and I, whether submerged or poured over, had our eyes opened. And all of a sudden, we could see. All of a sudden, we could see God and his glory and his splendor and his grace. And we saw the, the remnants of sin. We were, we were aware of how much had to be washed away. But more than that, we saw his glory, his light, his goodness. And then, as, this is what's crazy, is now, washed in Christ, we can see God, but we can also see the world more clearly. Because now when I'm talking to people, I'm not worried about my sin and my guilt and my shame. I'm not looking down because I don't want to feel pain, but I'm clean. Yes, I have sinned and I come back to that reality all the time, but in God's sight, I am washed as white as snow. And so I'm not looking at people wondering about my shame or or how I'm going to feel, but I'm free to see clearly, eye to eye. I can see the needs around me. I'm not looking, how can I appease my own guilt But I'm looking and saying, who has God put in my eyesight that needs something I can offer? A listening ear, a loving word, an act of service. I actually, this is what's crazy too, I'm no longer consumed with my own guilt or shame and so I can look around and see those people God has put in my eyesight and see they're suffering with shame just like I was. How can I offer them that same washing? 
hey, I know you feel ashamed, but let me tell you about the Jesus who washed this away. Because he was willing to die and take on sin for you so you could see clearly and rightly and know that you are loved. I can see people when they're feeling guilty. I can see people in need. And so the beauty of this reality is that when you were baptized, this was all given to you. For the Apostle Paul, right, he was an opponent of Jesus, through no will of his own, struck blind, and when he was baptized, scales fell from his eyes and he could finally see. And so for all of us, this reality of baptism is one where we are washed, we are clean, and now we can see. We can see one another for who we really are. In the light of God, we know that we are fellow creatures made in God's image. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I can see clearly the needs that people have, the places where God has given me unique gifts and opportunities to love and serve because I'm not focused on myself. I'm not blind. I can't see. I can see farther than this. I can see my whole eye range. And we come back to this every time we repent. Anytime you feel guilt or shame, you can handle it a few ways. You can, once again, try and rub it out yourself and say, you know, I'm just going to do some good things. You should do good things too. You can pretend it's not there. I, don't, I shouldn't feel this way. Or you can come to Christ and say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me once again. That promise you made in baptism washed me over with that so I may not feel the shame. We practice here at Sunday. We practice you're always welcome to come to me. We practice it when we pray a prayer of confession, when we go to a brother or sister in Christ. And notice then when, when somebody comes to you and you can tell they feel guilty or shameful, you don't have to say, oh, it's tough, right? Remember who Jesus made you to be. Remember what he did for you. Because at the end of time, we're told that we're going to get to see Jesus face to face. In this lifetime, sin is going to splatter up probably every day. <laughs> and so we see a little bit through a glass dimly. But one day we see face to face. And until then, this reality is true that Jesus, every day we come to him. Every time we come, we are washed anew to give us fresh eyes. And so we ask Christ, help me see clearly, not so I might be consumed with myself, but so I can pour out your love to those around, you, around me. Help me see them as you see them. May Christ give us these eyes now until we see him face to face. Amen.